You're welcome back. This is News File, it's your most authoritative news analysis show. And here on News File, we put Ghana first. Now, today is Democracy Day, it's International Day for Democracy. So, what is it that we are doing to improve our democratic culture? Hmm. I'm sure the CDD is concerned about clipping the imperial democratic president's, you know, winks. Let's see how that goes. But on the day of uh, the International Dem Democracy Day, I ask a simple question. Where is the $6.3 million document? Where is the $6.3 million document? In 2014, I wrote about cabinet subversion of the collective will of citizens when it cherry-picked what it deemed fit to accept and implement from the Constitution Review Commission's uh, work. Calls for a review of the 1992 Constitution certainly did not start with President John Kofor and the African peer review mechanism. But President John Mills eventually in January 2010 set up what by all standards was the best machinery in a group of Ghanaians to do the work. The Professor Albert Fiajo Commission would give us the biggest socio-political database ever in the country's history. They visited homes, villages, towns, cities, and countries, and holding over 57 sessions, receiving over 83,000 submissions, SMS, and employing varied new media platforms towards transforming a political constitution to a developmental constitution. It cost the taxpayer a whopping $6.3 million to compile the 1,000-page document. That's how much it cost us, $6.3 million. Citizens, ex-president, judges, political leaders, civil society expressed their desires, pointing to what ought to change in the Constitution. Almost everything that ought to be done was done with an implementation committee to ensure what was spent didn't go to waste and that the will of the citizens was carried out. The media, by Article 1625 of the Constitution, and citizens, by Article 41F, have a duty to hold government to account. On this day, International Day of Democracy. My take is simply to demand of government to tell citizens where we are with the Constitution Review, for which over $6 million was spent. My take today is that by the directive principles of state policy enshrined in the Constitution, this government, and whichever government later, has an obligation to continue the noble project and ought not be allowed to le leave it to rot and the money go to waste. Recently, government sought to mislead citizens that it wasn't going to cost the taxpayer a dime to build a cathedral. But it is now evident that that was a big lie because government had committed the public purse to relocate the judges judges to temporary residences, build 21 new homes in replacement for those it had decided should be demolished for the cathedral. It had committed the public pairs to build new places for several offices and institutions to be affected, as well as pay, quote unquote, millions of dollars, quote unquote, to relocate a sensitive international private IT provider in the rich location for the cathedral. By the dictates of the Constitution, right from its preamble, Articles 1, 21, to the last clause, governments have an obligation, not an option, to account to citizens. On this special day, Democracy Day, I appeal to all media and citizens to demand implementation of the CRC report we paid $6.3 million for because it has everything we ask for to improve our democracy. This is by way of my take. 
Thank you very much. And I've got three of my guests seated, and I am so happy today. And you know why. For those of you who continue to ask, where is the gender balance? What's going on? Men, too many men, always. Okay, so here you are. I'm happy to welcome Dr. Edith Dankwa, CEO, Business and Financial Times. They organize the Ghana Economic Summit. Good morning and welcome to News 5. Good morning. Thank you. Very good to have you. Also here in the studio, Clara Berry Cassati. She's a lawyer and teaches the law at Gimpa. Clara, welcome once again. Thank you. And Always good to, to have you. I'm happy to be here too. Right. Dr. Yao Osei Edichum. He's MP, Bosumchi, and Deputy Minister for Education. He went to Jachi Framso. I suppose... And Kumasi High School. And Kumasi High School, okay. Um, nobody will fight you <laughs> if, if you left Kumasi High, High out. Oh. We want to promote Jachi Framso. <laughs> okay, good morning and welcome. Good morning. Right. Thank so you. you know that he's the man who has the duty to ensure that whether you are going to Section Green or or gold, you are going to school, irrespective of how it is. We will, we will uh, have on the phone line, and he's already on the phone, joining us by phone, is Professor George K.T. Odro. He is Pro Vice Chancellor, University of Cape Coast, and he <laughs> has a specialty in education leadership. Thank you very much, Prof, for joining us on the phone. All right, so Prof, you do us a favor. You turn down the volume of your set, radio or television by you, and then listen to me directly on the phone, uh, or all of us directly on the phone. Thank you very much. We, we will have a second segment uh, with um, some other uh, panelists joining us, including Dr. Adisa Suleimana, lecturer, Department of Economics, University of Ghana, and Steve Opata, he's director of finance, uh, finance Markets Bank of Ghana. Of course, we will deal with the CD, trying to see if we still have it under lock and key. Obviously, it looks like it's broken jail or it's escaped from prison. And we definitely need to catch it and give the key back to Dr. Bahamia to lock it up and hand it, maybe this time, not to the IGP, because we don't know what he's done with the keys. <laughs> All right. So thank you very much. Now, um, of course, in the course of the week, um, if you have children who have to go to SHS, um, some people have had a very smooth transition, going to find their schools and settling. There are those who also have had a bit of a difficulty uh, finding their schools and settling. And so we will look at that issue, and that's the reason uh, Dr. Edichum is here. So let's listen quickly to uh, what Dr. Bahamia thinks about the double track system. And then we'll hear Professor Opoko Amankwa also what she thinks about the double track system. And then we'll come back to the studio and have our discussion. Of course, there are challenges of space. And that is why we are introducing the double track system. The churches have taught us that if you have one church building and you have many, many church goers, you can have first service at 7 o'clock and second service at 9 o'clock, and they will all still get the word of the Lord. One of the key issues that came up last year, around this time when schools reopened, was the issue was the issue of prospectors. And as a result of the prospectors and the issues that came up, we had to even call some heads and then sanction them. So we thought it wise this year to make sure that our prospectors for the various schools have been reviewed. We met with regional directors and then the heads when they were at their Charles conference, and we discussed, and we agreed that we should have some standards for prospectors in their schools. 
Okay. There are some payments that were made one off. Mm -hmm. Government paid once. For example, government says it's buying school uniform for you. If the school uniform that government bought for you, you could use it for the three years and beyond. You don't need as a parent to go and buy school uniform. Pick it. If the student can use it for the three years and beyond, we don't have any challenge with that. What we are saying is that for those things that government bought one off, whenever the student runs short of them, we expect the parents to supply them. Right, so Professor Pukwa Mankwa is the Director General of the Ghana Education Service. And um, thank you for joining us, Professor Dro, Pro Vice Chancellor of the University of Cape Coast. Hello, Hello Professor Dro. Okay. Um, let's, let's, let's try and get Professor Drew back um, to turn down or completely, you know, collapse the volume on his uh, set by him. But let me start with um, Dr. Edichung. Right. So 400 schools selected to host um, green and gold later, later in, the, in, the, in the course of the, of the year. Um, why, why, why is every school not participating, but 400 schools? Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here. And I want to say good morning to your audience. And I, I've realized after the first, uh, second appearance on your show that you have a pa um, powerful uh, platform. <laughs> People that were calling, they were coming from everywhere. Thank <laughs> so you. I'm honored to be uh, here once again. And our audiences are also excited about the fact that you communicate rather very clearly. Oh, thank right. you. Thank yeah. you. For a boy from the Atlantic Problem, so that's an honor. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, so far, things are going very well. And as you ask why 400, we did need assessment to see how many spaces, extra spaces do we need. So we had to look at the high demand schools because there's, you can't force a student to go to a certain particular school. Over the years, this was done where students were unilaterally placed in some schools. And parents said, no, I don't want my child to go here. So we just look at the high demand schools, schools that students want to go. And we have a school like Ghana National of 20,000 applicants. So if you're going to do double track, it has to be top on your list. Uh, so we selected those schools that have uh, high demand, and that is where we applied the double track. That's why we chose the 400 schools. The other close to 300 schools are on single track. So you don't need gold or green. They are going to school just like they used to go. And um, there are no, we don't have any major challenges with all the schools across the country that are single track. Okay. Uh, but double track is where the gold and the green comes in. And today we have green and a little bit of gold here. I thought it was. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, okay. So, so that is why we. Okay, you women, were you deliberate about this? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. More gold, he more has green. both, though. Yeah, yeah. there's some gold here. He has green as well. He has green as well. So, yeah. so, that I, green as well. so I couldn't be mm -hmm. accused of having a bias towards green or gold. So. Okay. <laughs> okay. Right. So the last time you were here and you, you, you assisted us to clearly understand why the choice mm. of the double track. Yes. A quick recap of that. And, and in summary, tell us okay. what exactly it is about before okay. we ask the questions that are coming up about whether or not what I, I say, whether we are going to get green, golden education yes, or no. yellow education. Okay, thank yeah. you. Thank you so much. Uh, as we previously discussed, and I've said it on many platforms, uh, we had a great opportunity. I don't say it's a problem. It's a great opportunity to educate our children. Out of the three senior high school, there has been a huge demand by parents that they want to send their children to school. Uh, because the previous year, uh, the BEC enrollment was, uh, the candidate who started BEC was 468,000. And it jumped to 521,000. When we did the analysis, we realized that we're going to need more space. And somebody would say, why did you wait till this time? Uh, the issue is that uh, over the years, there has been a different approach to placement of students. And you always hear about cutoff. And private schools demand cutoff. Everybody demand cutoff. And the cutoff was simply about ensuring that not everybody went. Um, and, and not to push them out deliberately, 
but we're matching demand with spaces available. So if it happened that 400,000 students sat for the exams, and let's say uh, 350,000 qualified, but we only have spaces for 250,000, what we'll do is say that, okay, if you got 24 or higher, you don't have space. So it's almost like you use like a fiat and uh, it's passed no way. So it doesn't mean based on why standards you have not passed, but the Ghana Education Service have no space for you. Mm. Therefore, you cannot go to second, public secondary school. And the place where these people found themselves was so interesting. Uh, because you see, in the public school system at the basic level, about 30% of our students are in private schools. Now, when you come to uh, the secondary level, those who went to a private school, the 30%, get to be about 90% or 95% of all the top schools. So if you want to the top 55 schools, the people who go there are the part of the 30% who went to the private schools. And in some schools, uh, you'd be hard pressed to find three or five students who went to public school. The private school candidates take their rightful places based on merit at the top performing schools. And so once they take those spots, the ones who get cut off are the ones who went to the public schools and did not get uh, high scores on the BEC. And when they, when they are cut off, then those who went to the public schools now have to go to private schools. So they are the ones who go to the private schools that have been complaining that they are losing their students. Those are the parents who are so disadvantaged, they don't have resources, but when the government cut them off, then they have to go and look for loans so that their students can go to private secondary schools. So you have this idea, interesting phenomenon in the country as a result of the cutoff. Mm. So with the free near high school, the president made a commitment and he told us when we met him that there should be no cutoff. If they qualify, if they've passed the exams, make sure they go. And those who do not pass, ask them to go and reset and the following year come back. So with this new directive from the president, um, we had no choice but to find a different way of educating all the students who exceed the spaces available. And in fact, when we spoke with the headmasters and compiled the number of spaces that they had, it was 277,000 spaces based on the students who were exiting the schools. And then you have, uh, we're able to build 13,200 capacity from e-blocks that we completed and other school expansion. So it brought us to about 292,000 spaces. And our projection showed that we have to accommodate uh, 472,000 minimum because we're going to place 497,000. So, okay, give and take. When you place 497,000, maybe some of them may not show up. And if 5% doesn't show up, you have 472,000 to deal with. And with that 472,000, then you need about 181 extra spaces to accommodate all of them if you do not introduce cutoff. So that is what led us to looking at how do we put these students in um, spaces in the classrooms when you have 181,000 students who the only option for you to really um, solve the problem is to cut, do a cutoff. Let's say 30 and say about 30, you can't go. About 24, you can't go. And then 181,000 will have to find a place. And I always talk about how we find places in this country. You see, when, when, you, when you go to a place where somebody is building and no drains are done and, and no landscaping work done, and think as if it's not going to rain. When it rains, the rains find their way. And that is how we've been doing things in this country. So if you put 181,000 students on the street, they will find their way. And sometimes they will find their way in places that we don't want to find them to find their way to. Mm -hmm. Okay, you say this is an opportunity and not a problem, but there are those uh, critics who say this was a self-inflicted problem. You didn't think through the implementation of the free senior uh, high school policy. Uh, you needed to have thought of how to graduate it properly, and you didn't do all of that. We'll talk about a bit of that, but let me go to Professor Drew. He clearly has identified some, some issues that require urgent attention if this system will produce you know, the kind of students that uh, we are looking for. Prof, thank you for joining Hello. us once again. 
Hello, Prof. Drew. Oh, hello. Yes. Thanks for joining Can us once again. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Um, and my and my greetings to the hardworking Honorable Deputy Minister of Education, Dr. Duchum, and uh, his team. Yeah. And I wish to commend him uh, in the first instance for the effort he's putting in to help educate the talented associated with the implementation okay. of the free SHS program. Okay. I'm told he's the brain behind a double track system. And I think it's under the circumstance that is the best um, initiative, really, uh, we, we can, as an intervention that can be used in addressing the challenges that uh, we have. Definitely, if we have a student population increasing to the extent that 181,000 students wouldn't get a place to study, then the double track system, I think, is it, the best intervention. But my, my concern has been, um, why did we have to wait and take such an ad hoc intervention? You see, if you are driving and you find a sign uh, not cautioning you about danger ahead, mm -hmm. and you decide to ignore it, you drive into the ditch, and now you employ an ad hoc measure to spend more energy. I think that, is, that, that, that has been my worry. You know, so once we try to find out how best we can address the issue of um, increased student enrollment, then the double track system is, is the best. So, so far as access expansion is concerned, for me, we need to praise the Ministry of Education and the Ghana Education Service for coming out with that. Um, if it's a question of quantity, then thumbs up for them. But if it is quality, that is where I have an issue. Um, the question is, what planning actually has gone into the double track system? Uh, 2017, or right from the 2016, when the Minister of Education said that thorough discussions had been made, all necessary plans had been put in place, and I remember when I suggested that the first year should be used in planning the implementation. Stakeholders to be informed what the freeness, the free education really means. Stakeholders to should meet and then plan to know even to, to find out even uh, if the free education should go for everybody. Uh, I got my lampooning and lambasting for the <laughs> Minister of Education. Others also contributed that we should plan. And I'm very sure if we had planned the implementation very well, the challenge wouldn't have been, as we are encountering now, to go for an ad hoc double track system. But we've already decided. And so I think what we need to do is to find out how best to implement the situation. And uh, one of the issues that the Deputy, Honorable Deputy Minister was raising, um, which I, I thought uh, we need to rethink, you know, the private schools that we have, you know, I agree that public school management or funding is different from private schools. But in a moment where we have private secondary schools, some do not have enrollment. I mean, if you get to some of the schools, you find that the buildings are there. Mm. They are not using the buildings. So could these private schools, if they had been engaged, could some of them not have agreed offering spaces to students are the same at no extra cost to the Ministry of Education. I think that's one, one alternative we could have used. The second alternative, I thought if planning, thinking has gone into it, we would have considered. Should we even continue making the free SHS free for everybody in the country? And, and really, when the Minister of Finance came out to say that he did not think that everybody 
to benefit from the free SHS, and some people started blasting him here and there. I thought that this is something that we need to think through. Because if we take schools like Wesley Girls, take Infantipim, take Achimota, mm. we don't have the statistics. But I strongly believe that 90% of students there, 90% of parents there, will be prepared to find their own uh, students. Couldn't we have saved money to act actually help the less endowed schools, like Minyaku Secondary Technical, where the lab, lab are suffering, so that at least we'll be balancing the quality, the quantity with quality. This, 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 this has been my worry, my concern. So it shouldn't just be because His Excellency wanted all students who pass to go to the schools, we should just go about and provide people uh, secondary school education. You, when um, uh, quality will be a challenge. For okay. me, it doesn't say if people just go through the school system, come out, and the nation cannot utilize them very well. Okay. I think that if we plan well and get people to the technical vocational schools, where I would have thought the free across board should have been prominent, mm. because that is where I think the development of this nation really uh, banks on. Okay. Uh, so, okay. So, so in, in short, what I'm saying is that right. we need to plan. Implementation plan should move beyond politics. All right. It must. Assume a national character mm. who is in the interest of the nation. Which yeah, you, you've you've canvassed. You've canvassed a lot of defense. points. You've canvassed a lot of points that I suspect. I mean, discerning listeners and viewers will know that you mean well. So just hold on briefly. Uh, uh, Dr. Dichum has been taking notes of <laughs> okay, the questions okay, you yeah. ask, and I'm sure he will give us some responses as to what interventions will come in. But so that he does it, you know, together. Um, I don't want to do a double track. He will do it one whole. <laughs> let's, hear, let's hear from uh, Dr. Edith Dankwa and also Clara also on this uh, double track. It started already. I don't know if you have any, you know, children or any relations who have already, you know, commenced the processes and whether you have been part of it or having listened, you know, to concerns raised by parents you know, and, and guardians, what do you have to say about this entire project? Yes, okay. Doc. Thank you. Mm. Um, we all appreciate the essence of education. And for me, um, having or giving the opportunity for some students, or let's say 80% or 70% or whatever percentage of students who have access to secondary education is very important. From where I sit, I look at the challenges that I have heard people are talking about. And I also look beyond that and look at the opportunities. What do I, why do I see opportunities? We are giving access to people who ordinarily wouldn't have attended Wesley Girls High School. So if Wesley Girls High School is taken or used to take 100 students, now they have the opportunity to take 200 students. And these 100, extra 100 students are going to benefit from the quality education at Wesley Girls High School. What are the other benefits? The children will be home for, let's say, two months or 40 days. What can parents do with their children? Because there are some secondary schools that you know, are boarding. Even the day students complain that um, sometimes teachers don't come. They don't show up. So you realize that at the end of the day, they take their exam. And there is a particular subject that the children did not do well. So we as parents, if it's free education, can we then redirect that investment to or into our children's education when they come back home? Beyond that, can we also look at a platform, whether we want to use the private schools to turn them into, let's say, clubs? We can do that in collaboration with governments. Can we turn them, can we have science clubs that ha um, allow the children to go in there and have practical experience. Can we have internships? If I'm a trader and I'm not in the formal setting and I'm a trader and my child comes home, I would love 
for my child to have such an experience. I will have to go to the market with her. So apart from us, we always complain that our educational system is you know, uh, geared towards the academic um, aspects and nothing else. Can we also look at the opportunity of getting our children involved in other areas, even sports? We all know that it's an issue now. Globally, sportsmen and women are doing so well, and we're gaining so much in terms of um, um, revenue or you know, capital, how do I put it? Um, inflows into the country. So if we have talented children who, can, who are not even uh, academically endowed and they can use sports to, as a career, why not? So I think that these are opportunities that we can also look at. But as we talk about the benefits, there are also challenges. What are some of the challenges? I look at the quality of education. Whilst we're at this double track system, are we able to build infrastructure? Are we able to um, upgrade the quality of the new teachers that we're going to employ? It's going to create some form of employment for teachers. We're bringing on board 8,000 new teachers. What is their capacity? How are we going to build their capacity to ensure that we get the best out of them? So definitely, there will be some teething problems to begin with. If we want to think about the problems we're going through, it will not begin because we know that this access, lack of access to education didn't start today. So it has to, there should, there would be a starting point. But what happens going forward, the way it is managed, for me, is very critical. All right. So hmm, just heard uh, Dr. Edith Dankwa there. And it's, it's interesting because you may, have, you may have followed discussion over the week, over the period. And you hardly hear people approach what is a problem in the way she just approached it as an opportunity. So she, for example, the, uh, uh, the suggestion she makes, the private schools that will have nothing doing, maybe turn them into, you know, clubs, science clubs and all of that. Very, very brilliant ideas there. Maybe if we tapped into it properly, we could do something better out of that. Now, Clara. What, what do you also say? Um, there definitely are, are issues. Uh, this morning it does appear everybody wants to approach the problems as opportunities rather than problems. <laughs> but that's the reality. Okay. Hmm. Um, Samson, I actually wish that this discussion on the double track was led by the academics on the ground, the teachers who are going to implement this policy and then the parents. I think they, they are in a unique position to be able to bring to bear. Right. From where I sit, I, I always say that I, I can look at it from the broader perspective of policy and as a Ghanaian. The fact of the matter, I always keep coming back to this because I get the sense that as a country, we forget the framework of our government. Now the framework, for if, if, because we keep forgetting, if I, I have to keep saying it, the framework of our government, as uh, put in the constitution that governs all of us is that we the, the framework of government must secure for all of us the benefits of liberty equality of opportunity and prosperity so for I as one equality of opportunity is very important so for that matter access to each and every child in Ghana it's most important. Yeah. We can't overemphasize that. And I don't think we can go beat about the bush about that. Access is very important. But from what the Honorable um, Deputy Minister said, something caught my attention when he talked about the fact that if you look at the Becky results, the, the private schools, their students do better than the public schools. Once we have identified this, is there a plan as to how to make sure that the schools in the public sector, the students in the public sectors, sectors are not disadvantaged. My reason being that if the, the children in the public schools are disadvantaged, we are defeating the whole purpose because they in reality don't have equality of opportunity. Mm -hmm. You just don't put them in schools and then disadvantage them in the kind of education you give them and pretend that they have, act they have equality of opportunity. So if the students in the public schools have a problem and they are not catching up, there's a problem. My question is, what is the problem? What accounts for this? And what are the solutions? And how is our, our government, uh, and in this case, the, the, the institution responsible for edu education, what steps are they taking to make sure 
that this issue is addressed. And it would be great to educate the people of Ghana on that. I, 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 I for one, believe that, look, we are big boys and girls now. Uh, we, we've, we've been practicing democracy for over, over 20 years. So we still can't afford to have the kind of problems that we have. If we still have these problems, then we are the problem. And we have to stop. At some point, we just have to wake up and decide that we are done we are done with unnecessary things. So for me, I, I would be interested because if the game plan is opportunity, of, opportunity for everybody, then we have to address the issue of quality. My other concern is access is very important. And like I said, we can't negotiate on that. But access cannot and must not detract from quality. By giving access, we shouldn't be seen to be diluting quality mm. just so that we can give access. Because bottom line, we all know where education plays in, in, in our national affairs. Our whole country depends on the human resource. So, and it is the quality of education that we give to this human resource that will determine what they, they, they can give back to the country. Anytime education comes up, I always remember my days as a student. I used to work uh, every long vacation. I would work most of the time as a research assistant for researchers. One of the... the, 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 the Got in, in the process of gathering data in rural Ghana and conducting interviews, I've, I met two particular women that I've never forgotten of. One of them was um, a lady that she, her, her language, her control over language was, I would put her even in her unlettered state, I would put, put her in the category of the Thomas Hardys and the high class literature, literature writers. And then my question was, if this woman had education, can we imagine what benefit that would do to our literary um, class? I met another illiterate woman. I didn't know she was on letter. But when we, we were doing the discussions, you could tell her responses. They were very scientific. And so at, at, at the end of the interview, I called her aside because I thought maybe she has, this was some, somebody who has some science background and probably due to say, certain circumstances, she ended up where she was. She hadn't been to class one. <laughs> and I wondered if that kind of woman had gotten education, what she could probably give to the country in return by exploiting her potential. So most of the time when you go around, of course, I always say that our country, when you look at the human resource, it's like when you walk around and you see a pipe burst and you see the water gushing out, just wasting, a lot of wastage, yet people don't have water. So we, 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 we claim we don't have what it takes to, we do have what it takes to develop the, our country within the people here. The only difference is that we are not equipping them enough. So for me, quality is important. And when we are coming back to the, to the issue of opportunity, we must go back to addressing the issue of quality. The double track, I want to know how long we plan to do this. Because we, he, I think he admits that it's a contingency. Mm. They, they, they had to come up with this because they were overwhelmed with ma numbers. That is the reality. That we are doing double track because we are overwhelmed with numbers. So my question is, how long is this going to, to go on? Because and what it's an emergency solution. It's a, exactly. It's so an, it won't so, be permanent. Yeah, exactly. So, and my, because my other fear is usually in Ghana, we like to say this is temporary. And then before you realize, the temporary solution has become a permanent solution. It will be true. So I, I hope this is real temporary. And in, because of that, I would appreciate timelines so that we, we, we know um, um, that at least we can hold you accountable to the timelines. When we get to those timelines, we want to see that the problem is resolved. So in conclusion on this, what I would say is I wish parents and teachers would debate this more. You're a parent. You're a teacher. You're forgetting no, that. But, yeah, no, okay. but I don't teach in the secondary school. Right. So I will not right. be at the forefront of implementing okay. the double track system. That's right. So to some extent, mm. I, am, I, may, I may hear what goes on, but then I may not, be, uh, I may not see the challenges <laughs> as those on the ground who see mm. it. Now, just quickly on the issue of the computerization, the posting, because that's a, another source of complaint. Parents complain that their children pick certain schools and they do qualify to go to those schools if you look at the criteria, criteria that is being used. But their children are not given those schools. And I have not had a, a mechanism to address that. Because if we come back to the computerization and we are saying that our reason for so doing is to make it blind so that you get to the school according to your performance. But in the implementation of it, it, it doesn't meet the goal. I expect that we would have a, a system to address that. There is. But there is okay. The time will come. Okay. So I would need to know, <laughs> I, I would want to know, yes, about a system to resolve those parents who have 
um, those kinds of issues. Otherwise, like I said, mm. I am for education to everybody. All right. Okay. Everybody. Okay. In principle. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, that was uh, Clara. Taking now, a lot of notes. Yes, uh, I've seen you have three sheets uh, <laughs> with all the issues that they have raised. Uh, of course, Prof started it with the question of quality. You sought to preempt him. He spoke about how knee jerk this has become, and you ought to have planned ahead of time and the couple of issues that he raised. So, since you have listed all of them, let's see how well you do. You know, well, I do. explaining okay. these matters to us. Uh, thank you for your contribution and submissions. Uh, you are on point in terms of what needs to happen and what ought to happen, and also to look at what we are doing. Uh, to be uh, very frank with you, when the professor talks about quality, I think quality should not be associated with a double track. We have a terrible school system. Terrible. But I think it has to change for the better. When you look at the WASI, and year in and out, about 65% do not get the credits that take them to tertiary. 65%. That tells you you don't have a system that is functioning well. So I agree with you that something needs to be done. But that something that needs to be done must not necessarily be linked with the fact that it's double track. Let's begin to track performance going forward. And that is why. We but the concern is germane. The concern that is that if, is they were spending, if they were spending a lot of time in school, mm -hmm. and even that, no, it's, it's even what? that, mm -hmm. they, they were not getting, giving results that you want. No, they were spending, now that they're going to spend barely uh, three months, or is it? Oh, no, no. Uh, of course, eight months in school. OK. okay. Eight calendar months. All right. Eight calendar months, 162 days, translate into eight calendar months. I'm talking about the semester. I'm oh, talking the, about the, the semester. Entirety. The yeah. semester, you see, the number of instructional days used to be 180 days, and it's going to be 162. So we are losing 18 days. So when people talk about long time at home, no, it's short by 18 days. But we make it up with a longer school day. So when you look at instructional hours, we've increased it from 1,080 hours to 1,134 hours. So the actual time with teachers has increased. Okay. But the number of days have been shortened by 18 days. So if you look at the, vac the length of the vacation, the reason why this is a little bit longer is because you have a semester system. So there are two vacations instead of three. So the vacation has become longer by 18 days. So it's not as if the kids are going to be home all year. We have 1,000 and 80 hours instruction compared with 1,134 hours of instruction under the new system. You have seven hours of, of teaching and learning compared to about five hours and 40, 40 minutes under the old system. So that is how you make it up in terms of contact hours. So we are not worse off in terms of the time that mm. teachers will have to teach the content. We are not worse off. Okay. But they, we also they, understand they are not it's taking, a new They are system. not taking semester exams. They, they are, they are and, taking and semester and exams. No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the entire, you know, the, the end game. Mm -hmm. you, you must have done the system where mm -hmm. you may have been familiar with mm -hmm. Bubra mm -hmm. at the university, mm -hmm. where we're told that it used to be very difficult because you do... A whole year. Yes, mm -hmm. and then you go and write the exam. Mm -hmm. And you have these children who have to break for so long mm -hmm. and having to come back and recalibrate all of that. There are genuine difficulties. Uh, uh, actually, they? actually, not that long. Let me kind of describe how the whole system works. You have Form 2 and Form 3 students together with a green track beginning at the same time. And the Form 2 and Form 3 students, because the semester system has, four, they stay in school for four months. The only time they will come home is a brief Christmas break. So they have four months of work done. And that four months translates into 81 instructional days. And that is where the confusion has come from. I was in a show when somebody was dividing the 162 by 30 and concluding that, hey, the students are spending just five months in school. No. Um, instructional month is about 19 days, 20 days at most. Because you take away all the weekends and holidays. So when we talk about 81 days, you are talking about four months calendar month. So if you are in Form 2, Form 3, you go to school and you spend four months instead of breaking after three months and coming back for, so because there are only two vacations. So you do four months, then you break for two months, mm. and then you come back and do another four months. Okay. And then you do the last vacation before you go to the next academic year. 
So form two and form three, or if you are in a single track school, four months, two months of break, four months, two months of break, you are done for the year, single mm -hmm. track school. Mm -hmm. If you happen to be in a double track school, the form two and the form threes go four months nonstop. And then they take their two month break and go another four months nonstop and take their two. Okay. The I've, only I've place seen you, where the I've only seen you place. note down the concerns raised in such yes. a neat chronological yes. order. So if you can keep it focused on and, that and instead deal of with the them double one track. after the other. Okay. Right. Yeah, so I'll briefly mention that mm. where we talk about double track, the form ones, mm. where in the double track schools, where I will have two groups. And it's scheduled in such a way that they will space in the school. So the green track goes for two months and break. But their semester is not over. And they take their two month break. So once, after they finish the two months, the gold track comes, and the gold track goes four months nonstop. But in the middle of the gold track's two months, the green track comes back and joins them. At mm. that time, Form 2 and Form 3 are done and they're on vacation. So the school is virtually empty. Mm. A school that had 3,000 students will only have 1,500 students. So if they have two dining halls, uh, schedules, and other things, so this is how you decongest the schools. And at any point in time, do you have more students there than the previous year? Okay. So then we go to the issue of quality. Mm -hmm. You see, quality, if you are, uh, you, you've done some education policy, you're going to realize that quality of education depends on a number of things. One of them is if you have a very good accreditation regime. In Ghana, we chose to have the school inspections instead of accreditation. Okay. So you don't have an external body that looks at how you are doing, like we do at the university level, whether you are public or private. So it's the school inspecting. So they inspect themselves. And, and the law then said, no, there should be an independent entity. And that's the National Inspectorate Board that has been set up to look at. So you have a school inspector who's supposed to inspect the schools in order to ensure quality, at least from outside. But the quality within the school, in terms of internal checks, you really have to have uh, uh, the, the way the classrooms are arranged, the way the teachers teach, so that children can retain what the teachers teach them. We are doing what the people call chew, poor, pass, and forget. And I call that chew, poor, fail, and forget. Mm -hmm. Because if 65% of your students are failing, how can you call it chew, poor, pass, and forget? Chew, poor, fail, and forget. Children are not retaining the learning in such a way that when the exams start, they don't have to memorize and they can still do well. So before double track, the system has not been performing. So Dr. Odro, uh, from University of Cape Coast, what I'm saying is that the system has not been performing. And my sister talked about quality. How do we improve quality so that the public school students are not disadvantaged? You see, if we do not have a national assessment program, there's no way we're going to improve quality in our public schools. Why do I say that? In this country, before you know that students of a particular school are not doing well, it's after 11 years. Two years of KG, six years of primary, three years of junior high, then BECE comes. And that is where we say, oh, the student didn't do well. 11 years. You don't have, we've started pilot EGRA, an assessment for English and, and mathematics. And that is what the Ministry of Education is now proposing to roll out nationwide. That means every single student will do assessment in primary two, primary four, primary six, why is that important? If they do the primary two assessment, the nation will get the data and say our primary, two, our primary two students are not reading at grade level. Then the school has an opportunity, the head teacher has an opportunity to ensure that there is intervention in primary three. We go back in primary four and say, what, how is the nation doing? Are students reading? Are they doing mathematics well? They are not. You have another year intervention, by the way. If you happen to be the head of a school where all primary two students fail the test, it's about time we talk about intervention for you <laughs> or you are out. Okay. So, so at the Ministry of Education... So maybe that's where the Lancashire exams comes in, comes the in. So exams. That, you see, the Lancashire, people talk about why should I go and take an exam? You see, if you get your degree, I cannot ask University of Cape Coast to upgrade your degree. But if you have a license, I can always ask you to upgrade yourself so that you can get another license. So the Lancashire become... So there are a number of quality issues. You talk about facilities. Mm. If the facilities but before the facilities, mm -hmm. as they spoke about the quality from uh, Professor Dro, uh, Dankwa, they mentioned the, the about uh, 9,000 teachers that you are going to bring on yes, board. Yes, yes, yes. Um, how, how was this planned? And how is it going to be executed in a way that will benefit you know, the Very students? Good. I think this was what was done. We wanted to avoid a situation where all the new teachers are put on one track. 
So the schools did their time too. For the first time, they came together. It was a workshop style. They brought a headmaster academic and a team of teachers to Accra. Uh, we went through using a software, develop uh, their uh, schedule for them. And they placed new teachers on all the tracks, Form 2, Form 3, Green and Gold. We have some of the new teachers. And, and then they were able to determine how many teachers they need uh, for each school and for each track. So with that done, the recruitment is then looking at how do I get, let's say, 10 math teachers for Achimota or five math uh, science teachers for Presec. So that is how the recruitment is it's based on the need at the school, uh, based on the various skills or expertise uh, that is uh, needed, and, and that is how the recruitment uh, is going. I know I took a lot in mm -hmm. the various areas mm -hmm. because I talk about how long the double track will take. Mm -hmm. uh, we estimate five to seven years. And I appreciate my sister's concern that uh, in this country, uh, people say temporary and become permanent. So we are not, we as politicians are not very well trusted. Okay. But we have a plan. Mm. And, and the plan is very simple. Instead of, you see, Get Fund is an organization that gets the tax dollars or tax cities from all of us and use it in construction, mm. uh, in building schools. If you go to any school in this country, whether it's basic, especially secondary university, there are so many uncompleted Get Fund programs. Mm. And it baffles understanding. Yeah, you had said you had identified how many of them that yes. were about, uh, is it 70 or 90 percent complete? 70 percent complete. 70 percent so, so complete, what, and you are going to finish those ones. So what we are Those were about how many? You we, gave a we figure. Need, we need yeah. 622 classroom blocks in order to accommodate all the students who are going this year. So when you add that, it means the next year you need a, the same number of classrooms. So what we have decided to do, and with the approval of the president, is to look at a different way for get fund to do construction, as is done in other countries. Uh, when you know that you have a dedicated task source and the revenue is going to come in, you don't wait to get the revenue every year and then you go and start a building and add on. I talk about how my father was a cocoa farmer. And to build his house, every year he molded some blocks, mm -hmm. added on, added on. Most people build that way. That's right. But when it comes to school construction, you cannot afford that. Because the children are here today. They are begging for space, and you are waiting every year. So in other jurisdictions, when you have a dedicated task source, you securitize it. So if you know that I need $1.5 billion to complete all buildings on all the campuses, what you do is that you look at get and say, okay, in 10 years' time, how much am I getting? And you can take 50% of it, as we are doing now, and the 50% that we projected will be about $1.5 billion. 500 million will build all uncompleted buildings in the senior high schools. 500 million will go to the universities to finish all. They also have a number of uncompleted blocks. And then 500 million go to business schools to do away with all these dilapidated buildings that are falling on students. So with this plan, I have no doubt in my mind that we can use about five to seven years and double track will be a thing of the And they ask about the private schools. Couldn't you have had a better partnership with the private it's, schools so it, that you, know, it's, you don't it's have very to, interesting. since this is an emergency? It's, it's very interesting. Mm. You see, buildings don't teach. There's so much that goes into making sure that the school works. So there's no doubt that private schools are great partners. And in the business school level, even with FQ, the enrollment is increasing. They, they are doing a good job. But you see, when you implement government policy, as has happened in Rwanda, when Rwanda invested in their basic schools and the public school system came back live, what has happened is that all private schools are closing. It's an un unintended consequence. So when we talk about quality, in the, as my sister pointed out, in the basic school level, which we have to tackle with national assessment, infrastructure, and all those things, wait till the public schools at the basic level get better. And parents in East Legon begin to yeah. see that I don't have to drive 10 miles away and I can put my child in my neighborhood schools. Private schools are going to have a challenge. So, so some of these policies, once you implement and implement it well, there's always an unintended consequence. So when people say that, why are you collapsing private schools? No, we are not collapsing private schools. We have an issue here. Parents have selected schools that they want their children to go to. In the middle of the whole thing in terms of placement, then you tell the parent that you select a Chimota, but by the way, there's a private school close by. Would you want to go there? That private school to the parent has no track record. They don't know about that school. So who, was, who would have gone to the private school 
Now, look at the double track. And, and I think one of the panelists pointed out, uh, if you go to Wesley Girls, now you have more students there. And by the way, the equity measure that we implemented last year is getting 30% of Wesley Girls students from public schools. And the report I, we got from the headmistress was that last year when the kids came in, because Wesley Girls has a very unique culture of learning, mm -hmm. they did a diagnostic assessment. They knew the public school students had some challenges. They began intervention for them by tutoring them. And according to her, the public school students are just keeping the pace with the private. So there's something about these disadvantaged students. If you open the opportunity for them, they grab it. Some of them may come from homes where the building is not that beautiful. Mm. So, still so, on the private schools, so, as, so you the private noted, school, other as you have noted, it's you difficult. Know, there, there was a suggestion mm -hmm. about what you may want to do alternatively with these Definitely. spaces. And some private schools have started. I went to Kumase, and there's a banner in front of the private school, pre-senior high school classes available. You see, private school developers are creative entrepreneurs. And you will not be surprised that somebody is hearing my sister and they are jumping. And by the time you realize there are banners everywhere and students will be trooping there, it's a great opportunity. Mm. And, and in terms of quality, we also have done intervention. Those, 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 those who may not be able to afford, and they, the reason for which we are providing free you know, education, will then have to sit to them. They can't and go it's, for it's this uh, pre... No, but, but the thing is this. It has always been. I <laughs> never had the opportunity to go to vacation classes. My f I was on the cocoa farm. But it was, now I look back and it was a great life experience that I had. It sets me apart from other people who may not be able to shoulder challenges. Mm. So I look back and say, my life on the cocoa farm in Wasa, Amenfi, was the best time of my life. Okay. But at that time, when I was on the cocoa farm and my friends were in vacation class in Kumase, I was not happy. But I look back and say, wow, that experience has prepared me well in all that I did in the US. I look back and say, wow, I learned so much. When my father has Well, said, the fact, though, may also be that around the uh, mighty Japas, you may not have found a place to attend uh, vacation classes. No, but I mean, because I have, the village schools and stuff, there's no vacation, opportunity no, for but, vacation. No, but classes. I was not even at Yati Prime to be on vacation. I was okay. in Wasab and Fido on okay. vacation. Okay. So that, that opportunity was not there for me. Right. But when children go to the market with their mothers, the practical thing that they are learning there, I always say that market women have the best. Uh, uh, customer service. Okay. Then, the, so they are learning customer service. When right. mom wants somebody to buy mm. from her, so buy. What What are the accolades? Okay. So, <laughs> so you have addressed the question of the private. I've seen you've gone through about three, four of them. You have captured. Uh, if you can briefly just uh, take care of uh, one or two more of what you have noted, so that we can. So, we so can when, have when guest, we get, guest, I always hear people talk about why are you in a hurry? Why are you in a hurry? from the famous uh, statement made by the president that he's in a hurry. And people say, why should, so you are doing this for political experience? And I said, no, look at South Korea 60 years ago. We were just like them. But what did they do differently? They focus on education. Mm. South Koreans came here uh, six months ago, we met with them, and they were giving us, preparing to give us a loan to build the Bunsu campus of the Eastern University. They showed us three graphs. I will explain it briefly. The first graph was the comparison between Ghana and South Korea in 1960 based on per capita income. And of course, we were better than them. And they, they showed us now per capita income. Of course, we have, we have been flawed by them. And then they said, let's look at the test. They asked us, why do you guys think? They said, we well, see, we are not smarter than you. But what do you guys think we are better off than you? And they showed us the third graph. And the third graph was the gross tertiary enrollment ratio. That is, if you take any group of young people between 18 and 23, how many of them have some kind of tertiary education or are in tertiary education institutions? In South Korea, the number is 93.6% in 2016. Ghana is 17%. And African average is 7%. So go figure. It's not about the presence in a hurry and wants to implement secondary education well, we as a hurry. political... Yes. There's no problem. Yeah, we, as, we, as we a political expediency. This is something that ought to be done. The people from disadvantaged backgrounds have been disadvantaged for too long, and it's about time. All of us come together and say they may not be our children, but if they are better off, this nation will be better off. Okay. All right. Um, Prof, you, you've been listening to Doc. Um, right. what, do you, what do you make of his uh, responses to some of the concerns that you raised, finally, um, and, and your very final remarks on the way forward? Okay, thank you very much.
Hello, Prof. Yeah. Hello, Prof. Uh, okay. Th thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, on our deputy minister, I think well, uh, he's responded to the issues, uh, especially with the uh, issue of quality. But the only hello. Yes, you are on. Hello. You are on, please. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. The issue of quality. And he did the issue of quality, yeah. Uh, once again, can you turn down the volume of the set before you by you, the your, your TV oh. or your radio? Just turn it off. Okay, thank you very much. Hello. Yeah. Yeah, but about you see he mentioned that the system hasn't been perfect. Perfect. I agree with him. And so if the system hadn't been perfect. Oh, okay, thank you. Is that okay? Yeah. So what I'm saying is that it is true that the system hadn't been perfect. But if we knew that the system hadn't been perfect, why do we have to rush and worsen the situation? Now, reference to South Korea, it is true. South Korea, some years back, I wasn't doing well. But South Korea didn't rush into implementing policies. South Korea had a roadmap. Yeah. And the, the first thing South Korea did was to tackle the mindset. So the mindset was tackled to get people think about nation, the nation, not partisan approaches to issues. So I think that one of the things we need to do as a nation is to try and get a national orientation towards um, implementing, uh, how do you call it, educational policies, planning and implementing educational policies. Now, having said that, let me quickly ask the Honorable Deputy Minister, uh, four years to come or five years to come, the universities would also encounter challenges in terms of enrolling the double-track students. What practical measures is being put in place to ensure that we will not migrate from double track to multi track in the years to come. That's my question. My concern. Okay, so so that will be your final. Your your question will be your final uh, contribution to this discussion. No, my final right? contribution will be that at this stage, let us discuss the issue of free SHS and double track from a national perspective. Let not people be tacked when they raise issues. Okay. Let listen. The ministry, especially, should listen and then engage people so that we can have a lasting solution to the challenges that we have. Because I strongly believe that Ghana, we have the resources to plan and succeed. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Drew. Now, he, he has a question, and there was a question by Clara that you didn't answer. Which that was about how long are we going to oh, have this? Five to seven years. You did five to seven years? Yeah, okay, yeah, I, did, I didn't yeah, pay attention. Yeah, okay. okay. Right. So quickly, yeah, he uh, has a question. A question. Mm. Very good question. And I think I answered it. And I said, we are not going to do education infrastructure development the way my father did build in his house. And what we're going to do is to securitize revenue that we project will come in, do the buildings today. And I even said, higher education is going to have 500 million so that all the uncompleted buildings will be completed on the university campuses so that access will not be inhibited. Uh, we know the amount the we are dedicating to mm -hmm. complete these projects. Do we know what projects they are? Do we know the no, number of actually the projects at the, at the, at the free senior, uh, Sorry, at the secondary level, when we did our analysis, we, saw, we thought we could complete all this, uh, uncompleted at the 70% level, all of them, and there are quite a number of them, including the e-blocks. Mm -hmm. The e-blocks are <laughs> in a number of locations. No funds were dedicated for their construction. And now we have to find a way to get those companies because it's Ghana people, it's people of Ghana. Okay, you are unable there. to give us the numbers. No, I don't okay. have the actual right. Thank uh, you. numbers of those. Thank you. Of okay, so um, yes, Edith, what do you say? He, he embraces the idea that you, the suggestion you made about what to make uh, the use to put the private schools. Mm -hmm. uh, beyond that, going forward, what, what should happen as the students get to school? Yeah, um, the double track system is here with us. And I think that going forward, we should um, monitor the process closely. Mm. 
and ensure that we don't dilute the quality of education. We have an opportunity to make changes. During the monitoring process, we also have to evaluate. Are we doing well or not? If yes, what can we add? If no, how can we um, add value to the process? So for me, I believe that the monitoring and evaluation process is very important and um, the recommendations that goes with it to improve um, the quality of education. I would love you know, to have a system whereby um, the quality is you know, um, increased so that at the end of the day we'll say that, oh, we all complained about it, we had fears um, because of change. Um, I mean, change is always a difficult thing to embrace, mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, um, we succeeded. If governments or as a country were able to invest so much in the quality of education in our people, um, you can, I'm sure we, we all know, we can attest to the fact that at the end of the day, we will develop as a country. Um, I don't want to use hard words here, but um, a country made up of um, illiterates, if I should put it that way, will not take us anywhere. And if we can use our natural resources to build the capacity of its citizens, why not? Mm. But for me, it's the process. And let's use the seven years to ensure that we build infrastructure so that um, down seven years, we won't come back sitting here and discussing what we should have done and we didn't do. Okay. So for yeah. me, I think it's a, it's a good thing to give access to people to education or for education. But going forward, let's see how we're able to move the process forward. Okay. Now, now Clara, obviously, uh, this is here with us. We have no other alternative except that, you know, elsewhere they would have piloted, as we know they have done elsewhere in Sierra Leone, they piloted, I think, for five years or so, and they had a budget clearly, you know, earmarked for how they were going to do the piloting project. Here we are, we started a program, obviously, you know, without, you know, a clear path. And now we have to deal with an emergency situation. As always, we are always fighting fires where, where we shouldn't. And yes, that is actually one of the reasons where, why we are where we are, where uh, our colleagues or people who were probably not where we are are doing much better than us today. But there was something I, I, I very much appreciate the honesty of the deputy minister when he talked about the fact that we have a terrible system that hasn't been performing for quite some time. That is, for me, a correct identification of the problem. What I think we also need to know is what is the roadmap for addressing th that problem? Because if we have identified a problem, we just can't talk about the problem, it will not go away. So what is the roadmap for us to, to solve that problem? And what are the timelines that we are sure that we will do A, B, C, D, and by the time we get to Z, we would have addressed the issue of quality. I, he talked about one of the, the ones being the licensure exam. Yeah. I am not, well, I think I, I would want to find out, but I am not sure that if you take the private schools that you're talking about, that they are more certificated than the, the teachers in the public schools. <laughs> I don't think right. they are more certificated, the teachers in the private schools. In fact, school, in the private schools, most often you find those who have not had uh, teacher training. Exactly. Yeah. And yet they are doing better than the, than the public schools. So like the deputy minister said, a it's a comprehensive issue. A lot of the supervision. That's so the what is the mm. institution doing about okay. that? Again, I come back that we just can't identify the problems mm. and talk about the problems like we've done. Yeah. This is the problem, this is the problem, that is the problem. What is the solution? And what is the roadmap to ensuring that we, we handle the solution? Because I keep, I've said this more than so many times that mm -hmm. I feel a little bit tired saying it again, but I have to say it it's again that so there are certain not? issues that are national issues. And under those national issues, regardless of wherever our backgrounds are or our preferences are politically, religiously, or culturally, we have to be able to, to congregate around those national issues. Education is one of them. We just cannot afford to toy around with education. So I think this is an issue, apart from talking about it, we need a clear roadmap with timelines as to how we are addressing it, the, a comprehensive identification of the various problems, and then, of course, corresponding solutions um, to those problems. 
And the issue of certification, I, I have always said that we, we are becoming more or less a country of certification. All we really want to do is just dish out certificates, more or less. <laughs> but whether or not we are actually giving the right quality of education we need for development is another matter. Okay. I think we need to focus on this, the skills that we equip our people with. Because like it or not, we are going to compete in the global world. Right. We are, we, are, we are training our people to compete in the global, right. global world. So this is something that we have to take. Uh, and just to add to what the prof said, the issue of tagging. I think when we start to discuss issues honestly and dispassionately without tagging people who have different views to uh, lumping them in one way or the other, that is what makes some people hesitant when it comes to discussing issues. So we also have to grow out of that. I think we, we are big boys and girls yeah. now. We should be able to grow out many of these, people, Many people these things. subscribe to the point of view that it was most unfortunate the manner in which Prof was initially attacked when he decided to analyze this issue by bringing out the problems associated with it. But I think we can move on now. Mm -hmm. Now, you... Uh, well, I, I think the yeah, map quickly. Have. Yeah, quickly go through that, and I'm picking a couple of questions yes. for you so that we, we close yes. this segment. We have a comprehensive education sector plan funded by DFID and other organizations with expect various stakeholders across the country have participated in it. Mm. And it's about to be outdoored very soon. Education sector, very comprehensive, 10-year plan. So it speaks to all these issues that we are talking about here. So, for example, when you talk about what do we do, that is what we are focusing on. We have to concede that the system is not working. And we, we just did not leave it there. So you talk about NACA, National Council for Curriculum Assessment. Now they are doing a curricular review for the country, and they are consulting various stakeholders to change the way students teach, uh, teachers teach, and students learn. That you can't sit in a classroom where the teacher knows it all, as they call sage on stage. Whatever the teacher says is final. You don't question it. You just write it down and give it back to the teacher. That will not lead us to the 21st century mm. that we want. So that all those reforms are taking place. And then you have school administration, mm. supervision, key, and the accountability. If I preside over a school where four percent, let me tell you, there are schools in Accra, where every year only four out of the hundred students are able to make it to go to tertiary level, four percent pass rate. Why should the headmaster continue to be there? And the question becomes, why is the headmaster not performing? You know, in this country, you do not have any qualification to become a headmaster. If you teach chemistry and you are the best chemistry teacher and the headmaster likes you, you become assistant, by the time you know you're a headmaster, you no, have no idea of school administration. Mm. You don't know human resource management. You don't know how uh, to um, motivate students to perform. So when students are not performing, the first thing you talk to some headmaster and they will tell you, um, those children these days don't like to learn. I said administrators these days don't know how to motivate students to learn. Mm -hmm. You see, so, so there's something in a very holistic approach and I don't tag anybody. This is a national issue. Right. We want to transform this country through education, and we have to hear all viewpoints, because at the end of the day, when I hear somebody's viewpoint, like I hear all the time, somebody comes to me and whispers in my ear, if you could have done it this way. When I do it, nobody knows that person who whispered in my ears anyway. Right. So when we accept criticism and we use it to improve the system, we end up even taking the credit. Nobody knows who. Excellent. So, so our approach yeah. now is, Bring your ideas. We'll see how best it can help us find you. And the last thing I will say is intervention grant. Mm. The, for the first time in this country, uh, over 300 million is being spent on intervention in our schools. So students don't have to sink or swim. As it is now, in various schools, you pay for extra classes, then you get extra support. If you're a parent and you can't afford, your child don't get extra support. That is a turn of the past moving forward this year. Intervention grants are going to the schools and teachers are going to use as extra pay, extra incentive, and then use that to support students who are not doing well, in addition to all students who are doing well who can be accelerated. Uh, so if you have 30% of Achimote students from public schools, you have to do a better job with them until we fix our public schools so that when they get to Achimota, you can't tell who went to a public school and when, who went to a private school. We'll continue to do okay. some intervention. Let me see if uh, the messages I have here contain some direct questions for you as we wrap up for this particular segment. Uh, I have a number of messages. Uh, Eja Adam uh, sends in one. He says, so people just can't reason small to see that the double track system means there were countless number of people who were staying home because they couldn't afford school fees. Does it not rather make more sense 
to find ways of making it work. These never do well, um, never do wells, have nothing to help our school system or to improve it, but are loudly speaking against this important policy. The parents whose children are enjoying free SHS will never be ungrateful to President Akofuado. The students who are enjoying free SHS will forever be grateful to His Excellency Nana Adudankwa Akofuado. Okay, so maybe you want to take uh, Dr. Educhum's approach to taking criticism, no matter how you know, violent or bad you think it is. Um, he has a very commendable approach to taking criticism, and we should all be optimistic and see how we can do about that. Musa Abato and Kumasi says that uh, what were we seeing? What are we seeing today? Uh, clearly tells you that NDC position has been vindicated, which is accessibility first and gradually implementing of the free SHS. Now, the gold track and green track system is exposing them. Single track, double track, very soon triple track would be introduced. That is what you get when the fundamentals of your free SHS are weak. Ghana's educational system is under attack. Ibrahim Kopa in Tamale writes, fundamentally, what we must understand is that the double track system is a dividend of the free SHS policy. Since the implementation of the free SHS policy, there has been a huge increase in enrollment of students in the various secondary schools. Okay, thank you. Kweku Owusu Mensa says, I disagree with Professor Odro on the advanced uh, planning of free SHS education. Let me use the automobile uh, building for example. There is no auto industry that does not have a blueprint before building. Therefore, it is okay to implement and look for challenges and solutions. Should Ghana sit down and put out a perfect blueprint before we build our nation? No. Let's move on. Okay, it appears uh, there are no questions for you, really. Yeah. Uh, there, are a few things. there are a few things you want to say. Okay, so do that quickly because we are taking yeah, yeah. we are we are taking a break to end this particular uh, okay. segment because we have a, okay, sure. a loaded show today. Uh, Clara wants to raise something, so let her do that, and then okay. you quickly do that. Yes, you you do that in two minutes. Sorry, yeah. yeah, you said you were going to address the issue of those parents whose yes, words make the cut-off point, but the computer didn't place them in their schools. Mm -hmm. uh, what they can do? Okay, there are two things that are happening. Uh, because parents in the past years were complaining that their children have been placed by the computer and they don't like the school, we came up with a system called self-placement, which means that if you selected, uh, let's say, uh, Wesley girls and you wanted to do science and you have aggregate eight, for example, there's no way you can get into Wesley girls. But if you from Wesley girls selected Holy Child, it may be difficult also to get into Holy Child if you want to do science. So we have students who may have selected those schools, and at the end, they will select a fourth school, which is a day school, and their day school may be at Chimota. By the time they get there to do science in Chimota, the place is filled up. So you get into the pool that is called for self-placement. So I'm talking to so, about students. They actually make the cut. So let's say they got a sex. Mm -hmm. They want to go to Wesley Girls and do science, and they got a sex, but the school, it didn't put them there. No, actually, not all people who get this could get into Wesley Girls. All ones. Oh, yes. Not even with double track. It's high demand school. And but if you, you have other students who, mm -hmm. let's say, made a nine and they are there. Yeah, because they, the chose, they chose get... visual arts. Mm -hmm. They okay. chose home economics. So they are, you see, <laughs> the interesting thing was Wesley girls used to do justify your inclusion. But the system did not make provision for that. Mm. So the system was about what program you choose according to program. So if you chose uh, Wesley girls and you said you wanted to do visual arts, with eight you can go there. If you are lucky with now, you can go. Okay. But it says, you said science, you couldn't. Mm. So that is what we are working with them, okay. that we can remove that barrier mm. and, and avoid those kind of situations. The program so, has already started, yeah, but, yeah. but groups so, like NAGRAD, very important stakeholders, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. continue to suggest to you that you need to uh, bring everybody together, you sit down and have a proper discussion. And we've met with NAGRAD over the years. Um, and this time around, NAGRAD was fully consulted. 
I mean, the point of the matter, though, is this. Public statements are always public statements. When you get into where I sit, um, and you hear some people make noise on the radio, you have to allow them to make the noise. You meet with them after. And that's why I don't respond to unions on, on TV shows and radios. Even when they sit next to me and they raise an issue, I tell them, why can't we talk behind the scenes? I'm not going to respond to what you are saying, but we can talk. We've done a lot of talking. If you look at the calendar that we, the schedule that we develop, you know who develop teachers. Volunteer teachers from Presec, from Accra Girls, from Achimota came together and they trained all the headmasters assistants across the country. You see, teachers are sleeping giants. Mm. If you give them the opportunity, they will really perform. And that's what I'm seeing. Volunteers of teachers call us all the time and say, can I go and help another school? We've deployed teachers from here who are going to help other schools do their schedule. Okay. So, yes, at the union position is there on radio, mm. and we talk to them behind the scenes to make sure things work. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Dr. Uh, Duchum. He is MP Busumchi and also he is um, Deputy Education Minister. He is the man who is uh, spearheading uh, the, the double track system under the free SHS. Thank you very much indeed. We'll take a break. When we return, I've got a new guest joining um, Clara and Edith. We'll be right back.